Good evening, everybody, or good morning, or good day, wherever you are, um, because I understand that there are people from uh, quite a few other countries as well as uh, from North America. Um, this evening, well, let, let me go back and recall last week. Last week, um, we kind of laid the groundwork by looking at um, a lot of um, data about social context and I hope that that was helpful for you. Uh, Maria says that she that she got a lot of positive feedback, and I thought, wow, if if you could hang on with with that, then um, it's going to be really fun from now on. <laughs> um, because um, this evening, today, and this session, um, we are going to look at the women in uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So synoptic gospels. And I will begin screen sharing. So hold on. I had said last week that we would um, the the women characters we'd be looking at, um, but also women at the tomb. I, I'll put that on the list, and we're not going to get to that until next week. There's there's really too much to deal with now. And when we we're, we're looking at the Gospel of John next week, um, some of the the women there, we will also look at the broader picture of women at the tomb. When we look at the the people, the women that we're going to look for this evening, they kind of fall into two categories or, or uh, two groups of disciples and prophets, and perhaps a little of both in some cases. But those are two lenses through which we can look at these women. A really quick review of um, the relationship, the, the theories about the relationship of these three Gospels. The two-source theory is the dominant one still, though it's not the only one, and that is that Matthew and Luke um, knew the Gospel of Mark and took their material that is in common with Mark from Mark. So Mark is a source for Matthew and Luke. And then there's another source, which we call Q sometimes. It, it, it's the it's this unknown source, which nobody's ever really seen, you know, but it, we, we see its effects. Uh, the, the, the material that Matthew and Luke have in common with each other, but not with Mark. Now, um, there have been other theories, certainly um, that Matthew borrowed from Luke, Luke borrowed from Matthew, Mark summarized, all of them, the book, the two of them, um, there are other theories, and they don't really affect our theme of, about um, women. So um, with that, let's go into looking at some of them. And actually, we're going to do prophets first, because prophets are so interesting. What are prophets? They're persons who are recognized as being able to bridge the gap between earth and heaven. You might say mystics too, but prophets are rather distinctive in their, uh, their mission to proclaim what they know. What is really important here, to my knowledge, this role is never denied to women. There are other roles in the church and in the assembly um, that are um, for in, in the church, obviously, bishops, presbyters, deacons. But nobody ever says a woman can't be a prophet. And I think the reason for that is that everybody recognizes that prophecy is a gift of the spirit. People don't designate prophets in the community. Rather, God designates prophets and uh, gives them to the community. So it's an important difference. And prophecy, of course, is public speech. So a prophet, there's a lovely thing that, that Balaam says in Numbers 24. Balaam, you remember, he's this prophet. Um, he's not Jewish uh, or Israelite. He's from another um uh, ethnicity, and he's recognized as a prophet, and there's somebody, there's a, another group that's fighting against Israel, and kind of hires him, uh, says, please come and uh, prophesy doom for Israel, 
give us a, 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 a good prophecy that we're going to win over Israel and Israel's going to lose. And Balaam is the one, you know, who has the adventures with the angel who is standing in his path, but he can't see the angel, but his donkey can. And he beats the donkey and the donkey says, why are you beating me? Uh, so we have a talking donkey in the story. And then he sees the angel. Uh, but he does continue, and he gets all set up to prophesy against Israel, and he can't do it because God has given him something else to prophesy, and it's all good for Israel, of course, because it's, you know the Israelites are telling this story. But at one point, he identifies how he sees a prophet, one who sees what God sees, who hears what God says, who knows what God knows. That's where he stops. And I add here, and is able to proclaim it by word and action. I, over the years, have developed a kind of a, my own informal list for identifying prophets, both biblical and, and otherwise. We have these conversations all the time. I'm sure you've had them. But who's a prophet today? Well, there are a couple of characteristics that I think, and the first is not everybody likes what you say because you have some very difficult things to say, and sometimes it causes conflict. Other times it can be very encouraging. Another characteristic is that prophets don't really want to be prophets because they recognize the, the price. They recognize the cost for themselves. Remember Jeremiah saying, I'm too young, and Isaiah saying, I, you know, I can't do this. And, and it, it's the prophet accepts that role sometimes very reluctantly. In these short stories about prophets, we don't always know that, but you can see it over the long run. And the final one, the final characteristic, I think, is that you never know until later whether prophecy is true or not. You never know until it actually has been fulfilled. And prophecy, of course, is not prediction of the future. It's reading of the present and reading of the effects that are going to happen in the future because of what is going on in the present. There are four women who are called prophets in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures. None of the four is in the Catholic lectionary. Why are we not surprised? The first is Miriam in the Exodus story. Uh, now, we, we use parts of the Exodus story, you know, in the Easter Vigil. It's either the second or third reading, depending on whether they put in the sacrifice of, of um, Isaac. Uh, and uh, there's even a, a refrain, you know, I will sing to the Lord triumphant, uh, and then horse and rider has been cast into the seas. It's a, it's a military victory poem. But in the middle of it, it says that Miriam, the prophet, who is the sister of Moses and Aaron, grabs her tambourine and leads the women in the celebration. <laughs> Part of that is taken for the Easter Vigil, but those two verses are left out that talk about the role of Miriam. Deborah is this wonderful uh, character in, in the story of Judges. The Song of Deborah, which is um, chapter four of Judges, is thought to be the oldest piece of literature in the Bible. And it is the, um, th this marvelous piece of poetry that, it, that celebrates the victory of Deborah and, and Barak, the general, um, over, the, um, the, over the Canaanites. Uh, Deborah is not only a prophet, she's a judge. Uh, she's one of these people who pre-monarchy in Israel, is recognized for her wisdom, and it says she sits under her palm tree, and people come to her for um, resolution of their differences. Uh, that's the role of the judge, to as it is today, to to um, side with uh, in a, in conflict. But she's also a prophet. 
And a wonderful story there of, you know, she says to Barak, where the Israelites are oppressed, we've, we've got to do something, we have to go to war. And he says, I won't go unless you come with me. And she says, yes, I will come with you. So she goes to, to uh, war with um, Barak and with the Israelites at Mount Tabor. So that's Deborah. Huldah is um, a, a woman, a married woman, um, whose husband has a job as keeper of the wardrobe in the royal palace in, in Jerusalem. And the, the occasion there is that um, they find, a, a, they're, like, they're doing house cleaning in the temple, and they find a scroll that they didn't know was there, and it contains um, elements that are um, that are frightening to be, because there are predictions of if you don't keep the law in this way, then some terrible things are going to happen. Scholars think that this may be, have been uh, um, the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, it may or may not. But anyway, they find this thing. So what are we going to do? We have to go to a prophet. We have to find out from a prophet what all this means. And they go to Huldah, who is otherwise unknown. What? There's one later um, reflection that says, this is the time when Jeremiah is there. Why didn't they go to Jeremiah? And the, and the rabbis give two different answers. One is he was out of town at the time and they couldn't get him. And the other was that Hulda was related to him and he thought maybe he, he sent it to the cousin. Anyway, um, Hulda is the one who, who receives the, the, um, the message and is able to interpret it to, um, to the people who come to her. The fourth one is, we assume it's it's Isaiah's wife. There's a, a reference there where he says, I went into the prophetess and she conceived and bore a son. Well, if it's not his wife, then it's his concubine or somebody else. But uh, the the uh, it, it's a sexual uh, reference to a female prophet who... The readers seem to know who she is. I mean, he doesn't seem it seemed that it, he doesn't think it's necessary to to identify her. So she's kind of a mysterious person. A later tradition adds Sarah, um, uh, Sarah in the uh, in her her tent, you know, waiting when when the visitors um, the three visitors come to Abraham. So we have references to women prophets in in the Old Testament and. In every case, uh, well, not so much with Mrs. Isaiah, but um, the other three um, speaking is part of their their um, exercise of prophecy. So let's turn to the New Testament and to the the Gospel of Luke. Uh, and here in in um, uh, chapter two, we have Anna, or which of course is the same name as Hannah. In Greek, there's no strong H pronunciation, and so all those from Hebrew get lost. And so she's Anna, but it is Hannah. It's the same name as the mother of Samuel, who in 1 Samuel 2 has a beautiful song at the birth of her son uh, that he will be a great prophet. And it's really worth looking at. It's the forerunner of the Magnificat, of course, of Mary's Magnificat. And I'll say more about this when we get to, to Mary, but um, this tradition of, of women's poetry is very old. The song, that's the song of um, Deborah. Uh, in, in the book of Judith, uh, Judith also has a song like this, uh, particularly celebrating two things, birth of a child, or a military victory. In the case of Deborah, it's it's the military victory, of course. Um, and with Mary and with Hannah, it, it's the birth of a child. So important events. And there's been some anthropological research about that too, um, about, about it being the role of women in Bedouin societies to compose and to lead poetic celebrations of important events. But here we have Anna 
in the temple who is not celebrating important uh, in a military victory. And, and the, the situation, of course, is the presentation of a newborn child, which is supposed to be done 40 days after birth, uh, a, for, a, a firstborn son um, in the temple with a sacrifice of thanksgiving. And so we have um, that that's the situation, of course, when Mary and Joseph bring baby Jesus. And I love this this sketch of um, of Anna. Anna is in passing called a prophet. She it, it tells some things about her. She's been a widow for more than 50 years. There's no mention of children, so perhaps her husband died quite early before they had any children. And it says that she spent all her time in prayer in the temple. And it's just in passing that it says that she's a prophet. Um, and one wonders, does Luke mean to say that she's recognized as a prophet or because of what she does now that she's a prophet? We don't know, but it's probably both that she is already recognized as having the gift of prophecy. And, and here, um, she does not get the, the, the poetry. It goes to Mary, of course, the Magnificat, and then to Zachary. But, um, she, but she is also, it is also said that she spoke about the child to everyone she encountered. And I think that's a lovely um, depiction there of, of Mary and Joseph being rather surprised <laughs> by what she has to say. And uh, and I point out here, it, it's in spite of the traditional prohibition on women speaking publicly, like 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12, but prophecy is always an exception. So she is speaking in the courtyard of the temple, uh, in, in a place where there are a lot of people. And of course, any of these examples of the women prophets in the Old Testament are also people, who, women who are speaking publicly. So there's always that exception. Uh, uh, that's something that um, I'll just say this in passing now, that it, it, it's a tension in the culture and it's a tension in early Christianity between the, the freedom, particularly for women prophets, and the idea of silence, of women uh, supposedly being silent. It, it's, it's something they're, they're, it's a tension they're living with all the time, I think. PowerPoint tends to get stuck on there. There we go. So let's take on Mary and Elizabeth, which is the, uh, uh, it's such a um, primal, uh, archetypal, archetypal, um, encounter and, and the exercise of prophecy. So during these days, Mary set out and she traveled to the hill country and she traveled in haste to a town of Judah where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. We know this, this is um, familiar. And when, Mary, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the infant leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, cried out in a loud voice, Blessed are you who have believed the promise of the Lord, that the promise of the Lord would be fulfilled. So she's using the, the formulation there of a beatitude. You know, um, there are lots of beatitudes. We're going to look at another one, too, in Luke 11. When people ask, well, how many Beatitudes are there? And we kind of say eight. Even there, even in Matthew 5, if you read it carefully, there are nine. There's, there's, a, there's a ninth one at the end that we don't put into the formula. Um, Beatitudes, they're, they're proclamations of blessed or happy or lucky. <laughs> lucky is this person, you know. Um, the very opening of the Psalms, blessed is the one who walks in the way of the Lord, is, is a Beatitude. So uh, Elizabeth, rather, is filled with the Holy Spirit. And for Luke, that's a sign. 
that's a sign of the exercise of prophecy. He loves that expression. And of course, the culmination of it is Pentecost in, in Acts 2. But this is the second of five times in Luke's gospel that someone is filled with the Holy Spirit. Simeon is, and then Elizabeth, Zechariah, John the Baptist later on, Jesus himself, it says he's filled with the Holy Spirit. And then nine times in the Acts of, Acts of the Apostles, somebody is filled with the Holy Spirit. So uh, for, for Luke, for Luke's gospel, that's a signal. You know? The uh, image that you see there is of, of a lovely set of statues in the church, in the courtyard of the church of the visitation at in Karim, in the um, suburbs of West Jerusalem. And all of the plaques that you see on the wall are the Magnificat, the text of the Magnificat in all different kinds of languages. Um, quite a very um, international and, and a beautiful thing. Now, the Magnificat, we know the Magnificat. Those of you who do evening prayer, pray it every day. It, it's, um, it's something that is very um, familiar to us. And it is, in fact, a proclamation of prophecy. Mary is portrayed there in, in this piece of oral poetry as a prophet. She's also a disciple, of course, and that's why I said the, the roles um, run into each other. But the, the um, text that she, the, shouldn't be, not text, the words, the words that she proclaims there really are um, a social agenda for turning things upside down. She begins very modestly my soul glorifies the lord and, and my spirit rejoices in god my savior who has and, and let me say this as um i didn't put it up on the screen you know the next line uh, for for he has looked upon what he has looked on the lowliness of his servant is a, a usual translation the word that is used for lowliness or humility, sometimes it's done, tapinosis really means being pressed down. The, the tapinoi are the, are the people who are oppressed. And humility isn't exactly it. It's oppression. The one who is pressed down, which is portraying Mary as one of the socially oppressed. We don't know. We, it's very difficult from the, the infancy gospel text to try to figure out what social status she would be. But for sure, it, the, the poverty of rural life, the very simple um, poverty in which people lived and it, so it, it he has looked upon the 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 um, oppression or the the being pressed down of his female slave the word is not servant it's slave it's the word that is used for for slavery but it's also used metaphorically, of course. This is not saying she's legally a slave. But I think we have to take that seriously. It's not talking about Mary's virtue of humility. It's talking about her low social status. Who is she that the Lord should come to her? And it's not that she feels that she's she's no good. It's it's her social status. It's that she's not an important person. She's not an, a person that somebody would recognize as being important. Okay. 
Now, she goes on to say, he has brought down the powerful from their thrones and raises, raised up the oppressed and has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. This is talking about a social revolution. And we say it very blithely, you know. Um, we, we don't take it seriously. Uh, it, it, it's a call for a revolution. Uh, which, and, and Luke is very preoccupied in his whole gospel about wealth and poverty. Can you be wealthy and uh, and and be a faithful follower? Um, and and what are the obligations of the wealthy to the poor? Luke is very concerned with that, and he sets it up very early with Mary's proclamation. One more um, gospel prophet here that I want to mention, and because she gets short shrift, you know. Um, in Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus is moving around with a crowd and a woman in the crowd raises her voice and says, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts that nursed you. And he says, rather blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Sounds like a put down. It is actually, I think, a, um, a, an answer, a, um, a, a repartee. Hmm? Um, it, it's, this is another beatitude. Um, she's saying, your mother must be really, really something. You know? and, um, and, and Jesus here, as earlier in the, in the synoptic stories, when he's inside and, um, and his, it says, your mother and your, your brothers and sisters are outside looking for you. And he says, who are my mother, and my brothers and my sisters? Those who hear the word of God and keep it. It's not um, a condemnation of the family, I think, but rather putting the disciples on the same level as the family so that he's extending the family and including the disciples in it. And that's what I think is going on here. So this this uh, nameless woman who has her moment in, in the crowd. While we're on uh, prophets, we, we should... Uh, uh, fold in a couple of others and and the four daughters of Philip in Acts because we're not going to deal with them directly um we don't know anything about them it, it simply says in Acts 21 9 that Philip this is Philip the evangelist this is Philip the the one with the story where he's on the on the road to Gaza and he encounters the eunuch and who gets baptized etc it's that Philip there are a number of Philips um at least we think it's that Philip so uh, it says that he has four uh, virgin daughters who were prophets, unmarried, single daughters who were prophets. We don't know any of their names. Um, there's a later tradition that three of them were buried with him at Heropolis, where there was a major um, sanctuary, a uh, memoria to Philip. Uh, and you, it went up, Heropolis is... Um, it's in uh, Western Asia Minor, Turkey today. And, and the ruins are there. And you, you go up this very steep um, staircase from the city below to come up to this little um, top of a mountain where there was a hexagonal church. It was a, a very interesting structure. Um, so uh, again, a mention of women prophets um, how did they exercise their prophet, prophecy? Um, we, we don't know. Simply a mention of them. But also, we need to pay a little bit of attention here, and we will come back to this when we're dealing with the Pauline churches. But the Corinthian women prophets of 1 Corinthians 11 and 14, again, the passage is not in the Roman lectionary. The, the passage in 1 Corinthians 11 is just as well the, that it's not because the whole thing is about um, uh, women wearing something on their head in public and, and uh, um, the man is the head of the woman and that, we're not going to get into that right now. But the very fact that he says anyone who prays or prophesies without a head covering shames her head. Duh, women are praying and prophesying. 
and they're doing it in public. They're speaking in public. First Corinthians 14 is really an interesting chapter. It's about uh, prophecy and, and speaking in tongues, the gift of speaking in tongues, which apparently was exercised in this community. But Paul says tongues are no good unless there's somebody who can interpret. So it's a, it's the function of prophecy again. And it's much better desire the gift of prophecy, much more than you desire the gift of tongues. When we read that, if you read it, it's not in the lectionary, do you imagine female prophets as well as male prophets? We've just three chapters before that, we have been told there are women who are praying and prophesying. We'll come back to that later. So let's move on to discipleship. And the, this comes from the Latin, discere discipulus or discipulus, it would be the, the um, ancient pronunciation, and discere. Um, and the Greek mathein or mathetes, is, it's one who learns, but the Latin and the Greek, um, uh, uh, dis discipulus and mathetes is, is one who learns. The word group occurs over 240 times. In, gospel, in the Gospels and Acts. So it is quite a common term, a denominator for people who follow Jesus. Now, this is a little exercise in imagination that I want you to do. When you read the Sermon on the Mount or hear it, or the wedding story at Cana, for example, how do you imagine the disciples in these scenes? Do you imagine all men? In the, the Cana story, Jesus came with his disciples to the wedding. He manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Do you imagine 12 men or something else? Or the two, two disciples in Luke 24 uh, on the way to Emmaus, uh, the day of the resurrection, one, the name of one is given, Cleopas. What about the other? Here's one depiction by um, the Benedictine Sister Marie Paul of the um, Benedictine Monastery on, on the Mount of Olives. It's a couple, a man and a woman. Is that the way you picture them? Or let's take Luke 11, 1. After Jesus had finished praying, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. How do you imagine that disciple who said that to, to Jesus in that scene? Or Jesus said to his disciples, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. How do you imagine that group of disciples? Especially things about eating and wearing. Women would be very concerned about that. Maybe more than their husbands. How do you imagine it? And all of this occurs in Luke's gospel after this passage. Going through cities and villages, the twelve were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. 
and Joanna, the wife of Herod Stewart, Husa, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their resources. Provided for them, uh, it's uh, the word is diakonun. They they did diakonia for them out of their resources. I put in in um, italics there and many others. We when we get to to Mary Magdalene in two weeks, we'll talk about the seven demons. Okay, but three women are named there. One of them, Joanna, the wife of, of a steward of Herod's, one, one uh, commentator some years ago said um, she's she's going around with with somebody who of whom her husband would certainly not approve. It, it, and that's a fascinating one because it doesn't say widow; it says wife. There's there's a different word for for widow. She's the wife of Herod Stewart. Um. How do these women and many others, how do they move around with Jesus? Now, um, there has been some discussion about this, and 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 uh, one scholar I know says that that would be impossible that the women would would be able to move in in a group like this, and there's some something to be said for that. Years ago, one um, interpreter um, talked about itinerant disciples and local sympathizers. And there may be something to that about local sympathizers, that is, people who, men or women, who don't move around all the time uh, with this group, but they give hospitality when when this group is in town, Jesus and the disciples. It, it, it's a, That's all an open question. But Luke is the only one who puts this right in the middle of the gospel like that, very early in the gospel. And we have plenty of disciples moving around with Jesus, talking to Jesus, interacting with Jesus after that. And I don't think we take seriously what Luke envisions here, that there really are um, women who are an integral part of this, and it's not just three, many others. Reinforced by similar uh, comments from Matthew and Mark, but much later. Matthew and Mark put this, this description at the time of the crucifixion. Luke is the only one who moves that reference back into the ministry of Jesus, very early, rather early in the ministry of Jesus. But it's the same thing, that there's this group of followers of Jesus, that there were many women with them, and that it was a mixed group that continued later in Jerusalem. You get that in Acts one uh, fourteen. So we have a, a triple attestation there. John doesn't say something like that. But the the three synoptics do of women who are part of this group of disciples. And I, I'm not sure that we just we, we don't um, take that as seriously as perhaps we should. So some women disciples, Mary and Martha. Um, this this is a story in Luke, of course. And the, the presumed social context here is very interesting. Two single women, uh, widows perhaps, it doesn't say that. It just says that they, they live together. There's no brother Lazarus here. That's in John. So you know the story. And, uh, and I like this little illustration. Jesus looks like, uh, oh, <laughs> maybe he's in trouble. <laughs> look at the look on, on Martha's face. But I have uh, I have a pet peeve on this and that is the, the the translation which is so prevalent that mary has chosen the best part in fact what the greek says is mary has chosen the good part 
and only the old King James Version and the older RSV, RSV um, pick up on that. Mary's chosen the good part. It's not a comparison. It's she's okay. Leave her alone. It, it's not. Com it, it's not saying that Mary it, it somehow it, it is doing something better here. But the Vulgate, the Latin, says optimum partem, the 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 best part, and that is what has that understanding has prevailed, uh, certainly in the West. Um, that and therefore it becomes a comparison. And then by the time you get to Augustine, you know, it's the contemplative life versus the active life, um, celibacy versus marriage and all of that. But that all of that is baggage, later baggage. I just want to present that I think it is a, a misunderstanding and a mistranslation to say that, um, to compare them in, su in such a way that Mary comes out better than Martha. Okay. Later tradition on Martha, we won't be going back on this much. Um, Martha uh, uh, gets Martha of Bethany. You have on the on the on the right side as the, the the sort of the practical housekeeper, um, but she also becomes one of the myrrh bearers, one of the um, people, one of the women who goes to the tomb, and um, Mary and Mary and Martha have all kinds of later. Um, vocations and roles. So I just thought I would throw that in. She also becomes the, the uh, in the Middle Ages, the slayer of the dragon. So we have two depictions of that. Now, I want to take up the purity issue here. Um, where to start on this? Um, in, in the attempt to understand Jesus in his own context. And in the attempt to portray Jesus as our hero, sometimes good and well-intentioned Christian interpreters fall into um, contrasting Jesus with his environment that he makes all kinds of exceptions. Um, he, he, for instance, um, touching the woman with the flow of blood and, oh, she's unclean, so, she, so he shouldn't touch her, but he does anyway. And so he breaks the purity laws and he's breaking through to freedom for women. And when we do that, we're making Jesus look good by making everybody else look bad. Um, Amy Jo Levine, uh, biblical scholar, says that you don't have to make everybody else look bad to make Jesus look good. So th this question about uh, purity laws being observed. The purity laws were formulated for the temple. For going in pilgrimage to the temple. And originally, that's where they're observed. And so in rural Galilee, people wouldn't care at all about purity. Okay? Now, enter the Pharisees. And the Pharisees get bad press in the, in the uh, New Testament. Um, the Pharisees were a very well-meaning uh, group who were religious reformers. And they were out to renew the spirit. Uh, in Israel, to to really uh, renew the the um, fervor, you know, by saying that all of life is just as holy as the temple. Now that sounds pretty good, huh? It's not just the temple that is holy, that is sacred. All of life is like that, and therefore, some of the the uh, observances that people do in the temple should be extended to all of life. Now, there's a historical problem here that the gospel seem to depict Pharisees interacting with Jesus in Galilee. And that's a, pro a historical problem. We, we really aren't sure that the Pharisees were that active in Galilee. But if they were, okay, then you have Jesus and the Pharisees disagreeing on some of these things about how to observe the purity laws. Um, 
it's not that all of Galilee was observing the purity laws uh, or were concerned about clean and unclean. <clears throat> Remember in um, Mark 7, Jesus doesn't critique all of, Ju of Judaism. It's the Pharisees he critiques for being more concerned about the, the purity of, of their vessels uh, uh, than about living uh, the moral life. So there's a real uh, critique of Jesus against the Pharisees, not, not his whole people. Uh, and that gets blown up and you hear it. Listen for it in homilies. You'll hear it. That... Um, Jesus breaks all of the, the 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 restraints, the restrictive rules uh, that were holding people back. That is a is a very dangerous stereotype of the Judaism of Jesus' day, and it gets extended into Judaism in general. So that's what I have to say about the purity issue. So let's move on. The Syrophoenician or Canaanite woman in Matthew fifteen. Yeah, uh, she's a Canaanite in Matthew, and Matthew is the story that really is is the good one because she uh, her daughter is sick. She is she's going after him. She's she's yelling at them, and and uh, the and Jesus pays no attention to her, and the disciples say, "Get rid of her. She's a nuisance." And Jesus uh, says to her, "I'm only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, not for you." And um, and and, and uh, it isn't fair to take the children's food and give it to the dogs and she comes back with this repartee of yeah but the puppies eat the crumbs that fall from the table and he says your faith is great and uh, she gets what she wants what she's asking for the traditional interpretation on this you know is that jesus is he knows exactly what he's doing and he's just testing her faith and he's just trying to see how far he can push her more recent interpretation which i think has some value is that uh, she, he he is he does know he's only he thinks he is only for Israel, and this is a an event that changes his mind, that breaks open um, that intention to say, oh, maybe there's more that, to this that I'm supposed to do. So interesting. So she's a disciple. Is she also a prophet? Because she has spoken to him the word that Jesus, that he needs to hear. This is an interesting depiction of it, and it shows the, the daughter at home sick. And, it, uh, and Jesus turning his back on her. But she wins. Um, she wins. And I think she's just as much prophet speaking the word to Jesus, prophesying to Jesus as she is disciple. So we have a little cartoon here. On the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. <laughs> so for further reading, um, these are some recommendations. Barbara Reed's book, Wisdom Feast, Wisdom's Feast. Carla Ricci on Mary Magdalene, many others. And we'll we'll get into that later on. And then, of course, Phyllis Zagano's Women Icons of Christ uh, de deals with the, the purity issue, among many other things. So that is the end of the comments. And I'm sure that you are going to have things to say. We have two um, messages in chat right now. Uh, the first is the Spirit Alive website that that um, uh, that Maria is giving us, and then. Um, Donna Allen says, "I also try to get my students to think about this image of disciples as women." When in Mark, he sends disciples to prepare the Passover meal. Yes, yes, very definitely. Yeah. 
So other comments, questions? How do you image disciples in those uh, those examples that I gave? Anybody want to comment on that? Uh, Peggy Fanning says, what role does the disciple play? The disciple is, first of all, one who learns, one who says, there's something here that I want to follow. Um, and becomes addicted, perhaps, <laughs> might be a word, um, who, who um, continues to follow, to remain faithful. And in the way that the gospel is preached to us, is, is given to us, the disciple then turns and becomes apostle. Next week, we're dealing with the Gospel of John, and, and I will um, talk about the Samaritan woman in that way. I think she's the model of discipleship and apostleship. Phyllis Zagano says, isn't it, isn't it more likely that, um, that the two on the road to Emmaus would be husband and wife, given the number of disciples and the demonstrated fact of women disciples? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, you know, you know the, the grammatical um, convention in Greek, as it is in Latin, is um, if you have a mixed group, you, you make it male uh, plural, masculine plural. So that hides, again, social invisibility, huh? It hides the um, the presence of women. We still do that with our words like, our, that are derived from Latin, alumna, alumna uh, alumni. When you have a group of women graduates, they're alumni, but if you have men, suddenly they're all alumni. It's, it's the same phenomenon. Okay, we have some chat and questions. Suzanne um, Barbarisi? Barbar Barbarisi. Um, how do you think what is known about women in the New Testament influences contemporary discussions about gender roles and women's leadership? Well, that depends on, on your take on biblical authority. Um, people who are consciously inspired by the Bible are going to want to um, use it to, um, to, to bring it in as an inspiration. And then of course you have people who are um, who have a very tight interpretation of biblical authority. And then you get to things like wives uh, be submissive to your husbands as, as, a, as a given, even though um, the slaves and masters is out the window. Um, so, we we pick and choose how we want to use the Bible. Everybody does, I think. And Anne Amadeo. I'm curious about your insight on the women at the well. Longest recorded conversation Jesus has, I think. She evangelizes the whole town. Wow, a disciple by Jesus' selection. Just heard, oops, I just heard you dealing with it next week. That's right. I'm not going to comment on that right now. And Q&A. Marianne McHugh, I usually equate the apostles, 12 men, with the word disciple. Therefore, it limits my image of who is present, not just men. Absolutely. Now, uh, I could say that, that more often than not, Matthew, when he says disciple, seems to mean the 12. But not Mark, not Luke for sure, not John. So um, that's right. We, we, our, our imagination is limited there uh, in, in equating the the. Well, and apostles and 12 is not the same either, remember? 
Somebody asked last week in 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus appeared, the risen Jesus appeared to uh, the, the 12 and the da-da-da-da, and then to the apostles. Um, at least in Paul's world, 12 and apostles are not the same. Luke tends to equate the 12 with the apostles. And 12, so important because of the 12 tribes, that when Judith, Judas falls out, they have to elect another person to, to take his place, you know. Um, but it's different in the different uh, Gospels. Wait a minute. Is there a spoken difference, this is Anne Abadeo, is there a spoken difference between apostle and disciple? Oh, I think I already answered that, yeah. Um, it depends on which gospel writer, but um, the disciples are by no means limited to the apostles. What about young girls in the New Testament? This is uh, Terry's disciple. What about young girls in the New Testament? For instance, healing the young girl. Is that critical that they are girls? Well, the, the fact that you have girls being healed, not only boys, um, that, that's something maybe to, to note. Um, I didn't go into every woman in the Synoptic Gospels, uh, for example, of people who are healed, um, because I... I I kind of you can't do everything, and I limited it to this evening to people, women who exercise agency, uh, who who do something, not uh, who are recipients. But yeah, the uh, is it critical that they are girls? Um, yeah, maybe it is that that um, that Jesus' healing is certainly not limited to to uh, men but i don't know if you mean girls young rather than than women um they're they're part of the community yeah thanks um, uh, when the, this is from maria i think when the lectionary excludes so many passages on women and art reinforces all male disciples it is easy to understand why we connect disciple and male. Yeah, art does it to us. Uh, and, and the lectionary excludes so many passages. But the lectionary has plenty of, of passages that simply say the disciples. And there it's our imagination that's that's doing the limiting, you know, and art, of course, art too. But that's somebody else's imagination. So if we can can free our imagination some. Uh, to to imagine a mixed group because it's so clear that the gospels say that that there are many women uh, that I think that's that's something that we can do you know Rita Houlihan Sister Nuria seems to say that the women in Luke eight one to three especially those named constitute a group of stable members among Jesus' followers. Uh-huh, that's, um, yeah, Nuria um, Kalupinages. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the names, though, well, we're going to look at this next week when we go to women in the tomb. The names, other than Mary Magdalene, change. It's not a stable group, um, except for Mary Magdalene. So, um, so to say that there's a group of stable members, um, as as stable uh, as stable as any any group can be, I guess in the Gospels, yeah. And Amadeo, do you see in a prophetic voice something happening with women in the upcoming synod? Uh, I have no idea what's going to come out of the, the synod. I, um, I, I think there will be something, some kind of a breakthrough about women. 
I wouldn't put my money on deacons. Um, but I, I'm very open to be pleasantly surprised. Um, I just recently, just the today, in fact, read the write-up in the National Catholic Reporter about the um, the, the negativity, the, the the campaign to to say it's a it's a it's a crisis. The synod is a crisis and it's a disaster and all of that, which may temper somehow uh, what's going to happen there. But I don't know. I mean, I I that I'm just going to leave to the Holy Spirit. Why, Phyllis? Okay, why not putting my money on deacons? Um, I'd like to, really would like to. I hope um, it may just be too much of a leap. Still, I hope I'm wrong. Um. Maybe I've, I think I've gotten everything that's in Q&A. No, I'm getting, I'm getting, getting a sign that there are three there, but there's a three that I've already dealt with. Maria, you see anything in Q&A that I haven't answered? No. I'm, getting, I'm getting the number four. Oh, there's another chat. Uh, no, I don't see anything else. But, but I do want to go back to Phyllis's why not put your money on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on women deacons. Uh, just, you know, because when you go back and you look at uh, the Acts of the Apostles and the, what what deacons did, women are already doing all of those things. So... Oh yeah, um, of course. it would just be uh, so. In a certain sense, then it, it, uh, your comment it, it might be like uh, one bridge too far to cross. Um, it, it would, in some ways, just simply be uh, affirming what already exists in the church. Uh, and yeah, uh, I, I I think the bridge too far to cross is sometimes the church has difficulty um, acknowledging what is in its own midst. I mean. We have the problem of pedophilia. We have the mm. the issue of homosexuality. So I I think the bridge too far to cross is not what already exists. It's the it's getting the church to acknowledge what already exists. what exists. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Phyllis says it's the old word. <laughs> it's the old word. <laughs> uh, and there was another um, it's another comment here. Wait a minute, or a question? Darn, I had it. Yeah, Anne Amadeo has a comment. Uh, uh, yeah, the the time is now with so many young women hungering for role models of women's leadership. Uh, Zagano has shown they, that this exists. Now is the time, or it dies. Well, I don't know, but I, I hope it's the time. Really, I do. I, I'm sorry that I said that, and um, you know, I'm just a I'm a realist. I I I, uh, right. uh, I have a keen sense of the difference between what I hope for and what might happen <laughs> so, in general <laughs> anybody else have a comment uh feel free if you're not a typer you might want to raise your hand um it's all probably a little hard to um uh for lynn to see hands because there's such a large set of uh of tiles but uh if you'd like to unmute uh which you can do by uh, going to your mute, unmute button, unmute, and uh, just speak out out loud, and she will be able to hear you. Hi, it's uh, Rita Houlihan. Hi, Rita. Great session. Thank you, Lynn. It's really fantastic uh, information presented so beautifully. Um, I have this burning fear that because the uh, current uh, bishops and priests have been exposed for so long to the lectionary that excludes, for example, the full resurrection story on Easter Sunday, you know, John's resurrection story, excludes Phoebe on a Saturday. Oh, well, you know, like that talk about fear um, of all places. Uh, they, they, in a way, they've been coddled. They've been able to like not have to preach on uh, texts that have women, you mm -hmm. know, making 
uh, making big statements. Um, they, you know, the, uh, the road to Emmaus, uh, the, the function where they said, they say some women from our group, you know, basically they're saying we didn't believe them, but boy, we really should believe them. That gets mm -hmm. buried because it's, you know, in such a big text and you're, uh, you know, it, but I do feel it's a coddling. It's a being able to just ignore the women who speak, um, uh, you know, can make it, can create a false impression that the way that they've come with what you mentioned last week, the Greco-Roman social invisibility, um, that, that that we should just continue it because they don't see the evidence that the women were uh, so active. Um, even though it's, you know, it's relatively small, like Mary Magdalene's only named 14 times and I think Peter's named 90, but still 14 is more than most of the other male apostles. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and she's, you know, and she's there, like Sandra Schneider said, you know, in, in her lecture at Boston College, she said, you know, they're not much, never mentioned, but then front and center, you come to the passion and the resurrection, and you cannot deny that they're, but yes, mm -hmm. you can deny it by excluding it from the lectionary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think yeah. that denial makes it easier to say yeah. no. To I, yeah, that's right. Well said. Um, I, I, I think it's important, important to note that it's, it's the... It's what we do, we in general, you know, it's what we do with the text. The problem is not the Bible. The problem is what we do with it. And that's with questions of biblical authority too. Um, yeah. Lynn, I think there was a question in the chat from someone named Namita Renu. Do you see, and the question is, do you see anything common to all women mentioned in the New Testament? Oh, I did see that while, while um, Rita was talking. Anything common to all the women, just that they're women. <laughs> um, I think that the fact that they're so different is is what is good, that uh, they're, they're real people. Um, I don't know. Um, who is the person who's asking it? Rita, somebody? Namita Renu. Okay. Um, if if you have something in mind, you could say it. Namita, are you here? Would you like to uh, just elaborate a little bit on your question? Mm -hmm. A question like that sounds as if there is something more to say. The very fact that uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, women have been mentioned in various books of the New Testament, mm -hmm. perhaps there was something, some quality which was striking. Of course, each one is unique. Yeah, but there must be something which is, you know, taking them above the crowd. Hmm. Well, uh, I'm thinking of the ones that, for instance, we've looked at tonight. Um, they all, they all take initiative. But that's not true, for instance, with a, with a girl being healed or something like that. But um, but there is a striking way in which the, a number of them they 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 have agency. They um, they they are persons who act and take chances uh, in, in some cases. So that's something that that a lot of them have in common. I think I, I wouldn't say every single woman who's mentioned does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Namita, are you our uh, participant joining us from India? Yes. Oh, uh -huh. welcome. You're very welcome. We saw yeah. your name, and we're very thank grateful. you. It's wonderful. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're it's we're thrilled to have you with us here. Um, can you tell us something about how scripture is read in India? This question that Sister Lynn asked about how you imagine uh, the disciples when you see them. Um, yeah. How is it where you are? Tell us your experience. I'm sorry, could you uh, please repeat your question? Yes, I said Sister Lynn asked before, um, when we read the word disciple in the New Testament, do we imagine only men or men and women? And I'm just wondering, uh, what what is your response to that question? 
in the indian culture if we see the ancient texts i'm not restricting myself to the uh, bible the word man or woman uh, sorry man or men includes the entire family it's not restricted only to the person who's named usually mm -hmm. the head of the family is mentioned and uh, that includes his entire family uh, all the women are included in that usually women are not mentioned separately uh, within the text and i think that culture is very similar to the uh, ancient roman culture mm -hmm. yeah thank you for sharing that <laughs> Well, we're going on 8-11. Um, we have about time for one more question. Anybody have one more question or comment for Lynn? Well, and I think we have a lot to think about tonight. And when we read scripture the next time and we come across the word disciple, <laughs> um, we're all going to have to do a little pause, take a deep breath, rearrange the visual in our head um, and start to see something different. And maybe when we see something different, we become something different for our church and our world. So thank you all for coming tonight. This was wonderful. See you next Thursday night. Please join us again and keep the spirit alive. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Wonderful Bye. program. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good it was night. fantastic. Thank you very Bye. much. Thank Good you. Bye-bye.